Welcome to part three, where we will look at the original, ancient, very old Tav Asherit uh, manuscripts, hand copied by the scribes and monks in Urhai, Odessa, now modern Turkey, around 800 BCE. Uh, let's say the date can vary, let's say between 800 and 900 BCE, because Andrew Gabriel Roth on his website, one of his videos, uh, his website, aramaicscriptures.com, aramaicscriptures.com, stated between 800 to 900 BCE. We are flexible. We're going to look at that Tav Asherit, the original ancient, very old manuscripts of the Old Testament in the Aramaic, of the sacred scribal language of God, that which he spoke to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and supposedly the men at the Tower of Babel spoke one to each other, translated into the nearest English equivalent by native-born Aramaic-speaking translator from Mesopotamia, Syria, Victorian Alexander. This is the Old Testament, Brita, or, as you know, Genesis in English. And it states here, it reads here, as a beginning, for he was that beginning, he was there in the beginning, the Son of God created the heavens and the earth. So it's entirely him. He created it. Because here it says, and the earth was for him and by him. And the darkness was over the face of infinite space and the Spirit of God was over the layers of waters. Or in your Americanized English Bible version, is hovering over those waters. The Spirit of God. In the Good News book, Bible has got translated as, in a footnote, Divine Wind. Okay, so, and in these two indications of the triune, okay, in this case here, because it's only got the Son of God uh, and the Spirit of God, that would be biune. But God's probably in the background here somewhere. Okay, we believe this here is referring to the Son of God as God. Okay, you can say, well, okay, uh, we'll take that as God. It's talking about God specifically in our version. Okay, so there, then you would have evidence of the triune in that very first verse. You have a look at the pictographs. Maybe have a look at uh, Dutch Uncle John or someone like that who explains it. Okay, and it points to God the Father, the owner of the tent, and the Son of God, the Messiah, who is the keeper of the tent, and so forth. You can always look at uh, other Messianic Jew that have basically said the same thing, but don't keep laughing through it, you know, like Dutch Uncle John does, giggling through it, whatever. Okay, if you wanted that, you know, just straight up, bam, give me that information, bam. Okay, uh, so you could compare that with John 1, verse 1 to 4. In the Galilean Aramaic manuscripts translated into the nearest English equivalent by the same Victor in the Alexander from a translator, an Aramaic speaking translator from uh, Mesopotamia, Syria. We're going to say Macadamia, but isn't that something completely different? Anyhow, um, so you can compare that with that, right? If you had that Aramaic New Testament with the Sophist New Testament, you can even compare it with your modern. Bible version, which would basically say the same thing. The only, only difference would be it says the word, which is the logos in the Greek, which is incorrect. It's a letter, Greek transliteration. But here it says in the beginning of creation there was the manifestation. That which wasn't revealed, nobody knew about from that very beginning. Okay, and then he was revealed eventually. Okay, God incarnate in the flesh, dwelt amongst men, etc. And even through the Old Testament, Especially this old Tav Asherit, Aramaic, Old Testament manuscripts translated into nearest English equivalent. It often speaks of the Christ, or at that time, the Son of God, dwelling amongst men, or meeting with men, talking with men, etc., etc. They were aware of him, right? And that manifestation, or that which wasn't revealed, but then eventually revealed, you didn't know about him, yeah? until a certain era and God was the embodiment of that manifestation so we're going to find that word embodiment we found several of them prior but they were like 
not really in depth. Okay, so we're trying to find one that fits to that sentence because if you don't know the meaning of that word, you're not going to understand what it's talking about. Okay, further down here. The one that it relates to. Personification, an embodiment of an entity, usually in the form of a person, embodied energy required to produce any goods, etc., etc. A person or thing that represents or is a typical example of an idea or quality. So I think these ones saying apply. Embodiment of something, and this is formal, a person or thing that represents or is a typical example of an idea or quality. So another one that doesn't fit. Have to keep looking for them, right? Embodiment, the the most noticeable characteristic or the basis of all they do. Okay, here's one here from Miriam Webster. To give a body to a spirit incarnate. Okay. To represent in human or animal form. Embodiment, definition, and meaning, Britannica. Someone or something that is a perfect representative or example of a quality idea, etc. So you could use that as well. Okay. Uh, the act of embodying or the state of being embodied. So God is basically embodied in the Christ. As the Christ said, me and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Okay. So one is in the other. One is a representation of the other. Some of these meanings are very short and they don't show that God is the embodiment of that manifestation. Here's another one. You're talking about giving a form to ideas that are usually not physical. But then it gives examples of like love, hate, love, hate and all that sort of stuff. This is probably the closest that we've found. Personification, embodiment of an entity, usually in the form of a person, embodied energy, etc., etc. Okay, what's this one? Uh, to represent a quality or an idea exactly uh, embodied in one man and use a range of signs, etc., etc. Okay, so yeah, hopefully you've got the idea of what we're trying to get at. Okay, so. Okay, so in the beginning of creation there was a manifestation or muta and that manifestation was with God and God was the embodiment of that manifestation. This was in the beginning with God, everything was within his power, otherwise nothing would ever exist. Through him there was life and life became the spark of humanity and that ensuing fire lights the darkness and darkness does not overshadow it. Okay, so we've jumped the gun a bit but we're going back to Exodus where it states here down further where Moses who was shepherding the herds of Jethro his king priest because remember he ran away from Egypt and he ended up there and he helped those women uh, to draw water because every time they try to draw it from this well these others would come and don't have to wait and then the father would say geez it took a long time so yeah these men you know these other people they, they jump in front of us when we're doing it you know, they don't help us they just jump in front of us and feed their camels or whatever, uh, water their camels or whatever and we have to wait and wait, you know until then they get lost and then yeah, we can draw the water, but this man uh, he looked like an Egyptian because he's dressed in Egyptian clothing he uh, he sort of stepped in front and helped us out, maybe he shooed them away, and that's why we come back earlier that's, that's why the father said, geez, early today, yeah, this is the reason so he says, go back and get this guy you know, welcome to our, him to our abode Give him some food, all that sort of stuff, because I'm really happy that he's you know, stood up for you, you know. 
didn't have to wait long time and end up being parched and dying of thirst. You're actually early today. Okay, so he's run away. Moses has run off into the desert because he's afraid that the Pharaoh's going to kill him because he killed that overseer, beat him to death uh, in front of two people who didn't know who witnessed it, and he buried him in the sand. And they said, who the hell do you think you are telling us to stop fighting? You're the one that killed that overseer yesterday, and you buried him in the sand. Oh, we'll be found out. I'm out of here. Okay, so Moses shepherded the herds of Jephro, his king priest, and fetched him sheep for the altar. And he came to the mountain of God at Kuriv. And there appeared to him the angel of the Lord, messenger of the Lord, through the waves of fire. Sometimes the Son of God is referred to as this throughout Scripture. Right? It's one of those Eastern things. Okay. But yeah, let's say this is a messenger of God, right? Through the waves of fire from inside the sun. Disk. Okay, so yeah, we're saying that this is actually referring to the Son of God, not an angel, if it's inside this particular sun disk, and you'll see why. And there appeared to him the angel of the Lord to the waves of fire from inside the sun disk. And he saw that the sun disk itself did not burn up, so it's not a burning bush. Remember, this is like original ancient manuscripts from the Apostolic Church of the East that were hand-copied by scribes and monks say 5,000 years, 6,000 years ago, whatever, uh, by scribes and monks in Urhai, Edessa, now in modern Turkey, or Urfa in Arabic. And Moses said, let me see. This must be indeed a great vision. That is why the disc is not burning up. Many people say, oh, it's a spaceship. Or ufologists, all that sort of stuff, because they're inside this disc. Well, if that's what you want to believe, okay, going to get Mary, not Mary, many, uh, ufologists saying, yeah, it's a spaceship and all this sort of stuff, right? Okay, it may not necessarily be inside. They may not necessarily be inside. It's in a spaceship. They may be on top of it. But like Goskini and Durzo's uh, Asterix and Obelix comics where that chieftain was carried around on a disc, a shield, right? Something like that. And maybe it was like that. But here it specifically says, and Moses said, let me see, this must be indeed a great vision. That is why the disc is not burning up. He's not saying, ooh, the burning bush. Because use your common sense and logic. When you burn a bush, you go outside there, chuck some petrol or whatever on a kerosene on a bush. You know, don't burn your house down, though, doing that. Okay? And it'll burn to ash. It's not going to burn forever, is it? And your people say, oh, but it might be divine burning. Yeah, it might be. It might not. It might look like it's burning, but it's not. Okay? And the Lord saw that he was approaching to look closer, that Moses was he's curious. He's like stepping a bit closer. And so God called him from inside the disc. Okay? So God, Father God, or God, called him from inside the disc. And he said, Moses, and Moses said, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, that's me, God. Uh, yeah, that's me. Look, looks at me. Behold, it is I. And he said to him, to Moses, God said to Moses, do not come near. Take off your sandals because the land that you stand on is holy ground. Yeah, because that circle, right? Going into that holy presence. So if it casts a light on that ground... Well, that was holy ground, right? And he said to God, uh, God said to Moses, uh, I am the God of your father, okay. Moses' his father, the God of Abraham, his ancestors, the God of Isaac, and his, his, his descendants, and the God of Jacob, Israel. And Moses hid himself from the faces, two or more, see? You can define faces, that's two or more. That he saw because he was afraid to look at God. So here, it's telling you, okay, two or more faces, and that's God. So that's the triune. It's the Trinity, but there's more of the triune because the Christian Trinity concept idea is a little bit you know it's, it's got this definition, but it's not deep like this ancient, very old Mesopotamian. Uh, definition and story behind the winged disc icon in the triune 
Godhead, right? Okay, it goes much deeper through this wing disc icon, etc. We know it because we learnt it. So we fully recognise it through the Victor Andy Alexander asking him questions and stuff like that. We studied it. And yeah, okay, see he's the God of Abraham, etc. etc. his ancestors. Moses hid from the face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen it's come to his attention, the slave robbers people in Egypt, the Israelites. And he has heard the agonies of the enslavement because they're just getting overworked. You know? More bricks, more bricks. Oh, we've not got no bricks. Oh, I get to find something to make bricks. We don't care what it is. Make bricks. Because I know what ails them. Yeah? What troubles them, right? And I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to take them up from that land to an expensive and good land. Okay, it's going to be like a land of milk and honey, plenty. To land, to a land that flows with milk and honey. To the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Okay. These Canaanites were those descendants of his forefathers, his ancestors, that went into that land. This is the son of Noah that went into the land of Put, Canaan, Mithraim, etc. And these other people that ended up there as well. These different tribes. And now behold, says God, the agony of the children of Israel has reached to me. Yeah? It's come to his attention. Well, he, yeah? It's like a smell. Uh, I always say scriptures we see. So the, the smell of their wickedness has... Uh, reach my nostrils or something like that you know that sort of term and and same with a um, sacrifice he, he smells the sacrifice and it's great uh, and you can also see the persecution by which the Egyptians oppressed them more bricks more bricks oh you got no bricks well you got better go find something to make bricks if you don't you know, give them a hard time a real hard time no excuse go and make some bricks why aren't you making bricks now come this is God speaking to Moses. I will send you to the Pharaoh or the king and take my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He'll liberate them. And Moses said to God, Who am I to go to the Pharaoh or the king and bring up the children of Israel out of Egypt? He was in fear, right? Oh, no, if I go back there, he'll probably kill me because of what I did, right? I killed that guy and buried him. And God said to him, I'll be with you, etc., etc. And you bring the people back to worship on this mountain, work on this mountain, right? Under this mountain. And Moses said to God, Yeah, uh, look, uh, I go to the children of Israel and I say to them, Lord, uh, yeah, Lord God of your ancestors has sent me over to you. And these people go, Okay. So if you spoke to that God, our God, what was his name? Uh, what am I going to say to them, God? And God said to, to Moses, uh, He ye, Asher he ye. And he said, This is what you will say to the children of Israel. When you go there and liberate them, uh, he yet has sent me over to you. And again, God said to Moses, This is what you shall tell the children of Israel that the Lord God of your ancestors, he's repeating himself, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, sent me over to you. This is his name to the end of the universe. And this is how you shall commemorate me, God. Right? Uh, he yet. From this century, the day he was standing there, from that age to the se to the end of all the centuries, or forever. Now go and gather all the elders of the children of Israel and say to them that the Lord God of your ancestors has revealed this to you. Yeah, Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so as to say this to you that you shall memorialize this memorial. Okay, so you remember that moment, this that memorial, right? It'll be a memorial of all that he has done for you in Egypt, the Israelites, right? He freed them from them, from the oppression. He liberated them through Moses. He took them out of there. And you shall tell them that he brought you out of the enslavement of the Egyptians to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, and Jebusites, etc., to the land that flows with milk and honey or abundance. Okay? And that is where the state of Israel is today. So what he basically was doing, he had a plan for them as his chosen Okay, to be this holy nation that dwelt there. Okay, 
worshipping him, uh, obeying his commandments, all that sort of stuff. This is way prior to the state of Israel. Okay, so they go into that land. And those people there were actually descendants of Noah's son, Canaan, right? Noah's son's son. Yeah. Okay, so they're all related. It's just time, they're separated by time. And I shall make them heed your voice. I'll listen to his voice. And you and the elders of the house of Israel shall enter into the presence of the king of Egypt. Okay. So Moses and Aaron as well, because Moses kept complaining down here. Oh, I'm no good. I'm a stutterer. I've never been any good at speaking to other people. Well, this sort of stuff, he kept making these excuses. So God said, look, cut it out. Okay, I'm going to get your brother Aaron. Or in that sense, it might be you know, fellow believer, brethren. It may have been his brother. Okay, which... Rabbi Toby is supposed to be a, a descendant of Moses' brother, right? And that's why he's a, a Levite or a Cohen, or Cohen, as he states in one of his uh, Tanakh talk videos. He's like a high priest, right? Shall enter into the presence of the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews, or the Israelites, has revealed this to us now that we must go and spend three days in the wilderness and make a sacrifice to our Lord God. Uh, here issue here and I know the king of Egypt will not allow you to go blah 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 okay and then as they leave after they've done these uh, miracles against the uh, Egyptians right? uh, Moses throws down his staff and it turns into a, well yeah the magicians they Maybe he throws down his stuff and it turns into this giant crocodile and they have their three little crocodiles and then that big one eats those little ones up and so they they do their magic, conjure up three snakes and he conjures up a snake and it's bigger and uglier and eats those little snakes. So the people that are watching go, wow, what happened, magicians? Uh, looks like you got defeated. Ha, ha, ha. Um, oh, well, that's given us the uh, insight that you're... Um, uh, that Moses' God, Aaron's God, is, is more powerful because uh, no matter what you do, he creates something bigger and it gobbles up your little uh, snakes or crocodiles. And then they saw all those, supposedly all those plagues going on. So they said, whoa, something powerful is going on. And then when they, the Israelites were finally uh, liberated from Egypt, okay, they were given all these, all this wealth like silver platters what does it say here um, I should give the nation to be perceived kindly in the eyes of the Egyptians it's the Israel, Israelite nation the house of Israel so that when you go out when you go you don't go empty handed there's a footnote in the case there beer literal Aramaic idiom beer so you're not walking out empty handed with nothing to show for it the wife shall ask your neighbour in the residence of her house with gold plates and silver plates and clothing so that you may clothe cloth your sons and your daughters and the Egyptians shall allow it they'll be like yeah 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 here you go I'm gonna get lost okay so they took a lot of the um, Egyptian people with them because they believed okay in the power of God through the uh, different things that Moses did with Aaron in the plagues and further on in scripture it's like these people that left Egypt went to the land of the Aramaeans dwelt there became converts or whatever and these people that were Aramaeans eventually went into Egypt and there's a big plan that uh, Egypt will become again uh, Israel and Assyria okay they were import, they've got an important role to play in latter prophecy according to these different scriptures we came across that quite a while ago well it's evident because uh, Jonah goes to Nineveh and preaches to these um, Asherai who supposedly idol worshippers and doing all these wicked unrighteous acts all that sort of stuff and they heard the uh, they heard Jonah talking about their, his particular God, 
and they believed and they converted they put on sackcloth threw dust all over themselves and even the animals and turned to the one true God so they were saved so and that's why the Christ uh, when he's standing in front of the Pharisees he says you know uh, the men of Nineveh they're going to rise up and they're going to judge this generation you know, in the future probably resurrection they'll be resurrected and they'll judge that particular generation and those Pharisees who didn't believe that he was the son of God or we're trying to discredit him or get rid of him etc okay, so that's evidence there oh no we haven't completed the evidence ok so here in the footnotes from 3.14 Exodus 3.14 little Aramaic one Ahia the one who comes and is coming the absolute sense of the one who comes and that's talking about Jesus the Messiah okay. the one who is to come the absolute sense of the one who comes two Asher the beginning spark that kindles the fire or the light. Now, what, where did we see that? Okay, let's go back to Genesis, right? Or John even. There's footnotes here. Okay, it says, Through him there is life, and life became the spark of humanity, and that ensuing fire lights the darkness, and darkness does not overshadow it. So that's a comparison there. Okay, you could even go to John and say the same thing. Way down here in the footnotes. Well, it should say it down here somewhere. Okay. Uh, life everlasting. Capitalized in translation in peace is life. Okay. Okay, so it's basically indicating there. Or maybe it's better here without that footnote to get it from here. Okay. Through him there was life, and life became the spark of humanity. And the ensuing fire lights the darkness, and darkness does not overshadow it. So he's that spark of life, he's that light, etc. So it's backing up Genesis, this Exodus with John, okay, and vice versa. Okay. So we're going to go back to Exodus. Okay, and the first one was. Aramaic, uh, he yet the one who comes and is coming, you, the absolute sense of the one who comes. Okay. That's Yeshua Meshika or Jesus the Messiah. Asher, the beginning spark that kindles the fire or the light. Again, the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah or Yeshua Meshika. He yet, his coming, the one who's coming. Right? Prophesies to come from the very beginning. For a uh, he yet and he are uh, related forms of the same word. They mean more than the coming. They signify also the eternal presence, the ever-present and the never-ceasing intent of the coming to come, i.e. Yeshua Meshika, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, God incarnated in the flesh. 5. In the same way, Asher signifies the uncreated creator who creates everything from nothing. And who was that? The Son of God. Okay? okay this Exodus went in the wrong book. Okay, so... To verify that, he is the uncreated creator. The Son of God creates heavens and earth. Yeah? Gospel of John. In the beginning of creation, there was a manifestation of the motor, and that manifestation was with God, and God was the embodiment of that manifestation. It's in the beginning, and he created everything. Everything was within, within his power, otherwise nothing would ever exist. Through him there was life and the spark of humanity, and so forth. So that's basically backing each book up okay that he's the uncreated creator which it states here so these Jehovah Witnesses that came and said no he was begotten that means in the English definition they were basically looking at or trying to explain that he was created that God created him at some point we said no because here it says he's the uncreated creator who created everything he's existed from the beginning as he was that beginning yeah? and then there's that one we're talking about the winged disc icon Asher signifies above the flames or the Elohim which is very different in spelling and also meaning to your Hebrew Elohim which is the God or the gods okay? El is the article the okay? and El is the pagan god of the Canaanites apparently Abraham scripted it wrong it's supposed to be eel. He scripted it out. Okay, so we're not we're changing our uh, 
uh, former idea that they went there and they embraced the religion, uh, the culture, uh, the language, their gods, all that sort of stuff. They may have done that, but that particular scripture is not, and Genesis is not indicating that to us, right? That's what you call assuming. Okay, so that verifies there from the very old Tav Asherit, the Shana Atika, the sacred scribal language of God, Brita, or Genesis in English, translated into nearest English equivalent, that the Christ is God. Yeah. In that monotheistic sense, we believe. Uh, there's three, yet they're one. They're one and the same. But they can divide or separate to do to fulfill some uh, purpose or plan you know like uh, the Christ because there's no other way there's, because of the sin fall of man he's fallen short of the glory of God right there's a great divide that's created sin separates man from God so he can't come to God anymore okay? so how the heck is he going to go back to God how's he going to be saved he's destined every man being woman child etc is destined to go to eternal oblivion or perish right at this point okay, when men sinned well, Adam, uh, Eve sinned then Adam sinned and then men kept sinning down through the centuries there's this great divide great chasm you can't get across it okay? a spiritual chasm which separates those of the the children of the devil those unrighteous those wicked who are in torment let's say they're in hell or whatever right it's got that separation there so they can't cross over and no one from heaven can cross over to there and walk around there ooh go on a tour you know sell some tickets and go on a tour around hell well you know this is this is uh, hell valley 2 okay? they, they can't do sightseeing right to put it that way yeah. so there had to be this bridge back across to get to God right so if you look at the cross picture of the cross let's say uh, there's a capital T here somewhere stick it out here say this is this T here is the cross right Okay, with the extra bit at the top there. Well, just that, right? Okay, see how it's got the top of that T? Here's God, okay, the 22. Here's man. Okay, there's a big gap here. For example, we just use this as an example, right? There's a gap in between. So how the heck are they going to get, how, how the heck are people going to get to God if there's a big gap there, a big divide? So what happens is Christ becomes that bridge across, yeah, the way back and that's why he said I am the way the life uh, I am the way the truth and the life man cannot go back to God come back to God but through me he's the means back so you're a pope okay, all those sort of people who say I'm the vice regent you have to come to me for sins to be forgiven pay penance pay penitence chuck us some coin whatever uh, others that are guru self proclaimed guru saying well you can only come through me because God stepped uh, Jesus stepped down he's having a holiday uh, as this guy said in Korea or something like that and he gave me the authority on his replacement with well, this sort of rubbish now pay me all your student loan uh, you're paying for your uh, at your university or something like that you have to pay it all to me all that sort of garbage right or someone else who says something similar to that okay there's no intermediary between God and man but Christ okay so Sai Baba, all these other Indian gurus, Buddha, and all this sort of stuff, it's all baloney. Yeah. The only one that's the way back to God is Jesus. Yeah, as stated by him in Christian um, in the scriptures. Okay. So hopefully that verifies there that well we believe it does, that he is the uncreated creator. Okay, that he is God. And there's plenty of other verses that say, O oh Allah, even your Allah, O oh God, even your God says your kingdom will live forever. And he comes, will be forever. And he comes in the name of his father, which is Maran Allah. Yeah. And he has this title, which is only for him. It's a sacred title. Maria Isha Mashika. Okay. Lord God. Okay. So Thomas when he saw him he didn't he's the doubter he didn't believe that 
this was the Christ that was resurrected. Okay, and she's no, no, I'm doubting that you are who you say you are. And he says, look, put your fingers in my wrists or my heart, uh, hands where the nails were inserted and and at the cut on my side. Okay, and then when Thomas did that, he realized, and then he exclaimed, my Allah, my Allah, or my God, my God, in the original Aramaic, Galilean Aramaic, because that's what he spoke. Okay, and that's what it's, it's translated from into the New Testament equivalent. Okay, my Lord God, my Allah, my God, my Master, right? etc., etc. Okay, so it goes beyond the simple scriptures of Peter, etc., saying, "Come on, Lord, you are the Messiah. You are God's Messiah, right?" Okay, it goes beyond that, and they realize that at some point that he was indeed God. Okay. Part of that triune Godhead. Yeah, it's a monotheistic thing, it's really hard to get your head around. Okay, we'd have to keep doing a video on it to really get it into your head and have to you to fully understand it. But it's basically like that. So we see other religions as well, like there's Chinese the history apparently we come across one like that. Uh maybe it's the Han dynasty or something like that. This guy, whatever his name was, he said they this guy said Evangelist, what he was trying to in their language, that he was one who believed that there was one supreme God, okay, one God, monotheistic God, but it's like there's three, but they're one. Yeah, it's kind of weird. And we looked at, we were looking at other religions as well, like Hinduism, and originally they may have had the same concept, but somewhere along the way somebody corrupted it. And more in favour of polytheistic, or well, not polytheistic, uh, pantheism, right? having more than one god, multiple gods, three thousand gods, thirty thousand gods, okay, all different colours, green, blue, yellow, all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, different people had, the, even the Egyptians, they seem to they appear to have, uh, according to this Kabbalah that we read, they had that same sort of monotheistic idea prior to when. Akhenaten come along and it was short lived his reign was short lived and then when his son sat on the throne his people uh, the people wanted to go back to that pantheism the worship of many gods so maybe the oracles said to the son well for you to uh, be able to sit on that throne and rule the people as well you have to do what the people suggest right so he embraced that and according to that Zawa Hawas Zawi Hawas or whatever it is that Egyptian archaeologist on one of his documentaries, he comes up with a fronts up with a shoebox, and it's got these small mummified remains of these two children of this son. Okay, and he said, "Well, because they believed that the god was androgynous, okay, both male and female, or hermaphrodite, okay, half male, half female. So they were emulating their god supposedly. So he married his half sister, and then they had these children, and of course." too closely related, something like that, uh, then they end up with club feet. And we do know of people that have club feet, but we're not going to go into that because, you know, just no, it could be possibility that these people didn't know that they were related that close, right? So their children had club feet, and then their children had club feet. We don't know that, okay? But we'll leave it alone because that's their thing, right? Okay? And they get upset that we're saying that, you know? They think, oh, God's cursed us because of that. But then they may find that, yeah, okay, oh, geez, we didn't know we were that related, you know. Not saying that they're deliberately performing incest, but, you know, you don't know who you're marrying, really. It could be your first cousin, or you know, you know. They could be living in another country, you meet them, you get married, and then, oh, it's revealed through your DNA testing, you're both related. Very, very closely related. It's like, ooh, 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 you know. This has happened to many people around the world. Okay, so we believe that verifies that he is the uncreated creator. He created all, that he is actually the son of God, that he is God. Okay, God manifest in the flesh, God incarnate in the flesh. God made man, okay, and so forth. So if you like this video, uh, please give us a like. We'd really like that. And um, subscribe to our channel and then add your comments below. 
because uh, you may give us some insight into something else and we'll credit you for that if you bring it to us uh, maturely uh, like an adult not a spoiled brat in a uh, supermarket or a candy shop that was deprived by his parents of a lolly okay um, yeah because we don't do that to you so please don't do that to us anyway so if you liked it subscribe to us uh, then go share this with all your family friends and others your neighbours maybe you evangelise on the street yeah and so forth thank you for taking the time to watch this our latest video upload we really hope you enjoyed it give us some feedback so we know oh yeah and shout out to all those who are uh, our loyal subscribers those who have viewed our videos those who have made their comments whether good or bad you're much appreciated we're at 1024 all because of you party party at our house no <laughs> I don't think so anyway thank you for that God bless you all and son of God bless you all as well give you many blessings make your life more abundant fruitful uh, prosperous etc etc yeah you are deserving of it.